Hello and welcome along to the VAR for your Tohoku Japan 2011 GIS task. Now, the video as ever will give you help and instructions in carrying out the task, but we're just going to set a little bit of a broader context for you before we jump into the task itself. So if you remember what we're taking a look at here is the short term and indeed long term impacts on people and the environment. So your notes will end up looking something like this, which will tell you a lot of detail about it. But what we really want to do is to give you a real sense of this earthquake because it happened in a particular place things like these photographs will help but we're going to jump on into our GIS task and that'll really help us to get a sense of the place that this happened in so we're going to start off with something this isn't in your task it's just a little give you a little bit of a general overview for it and we're going to take a wee look at the tsunami wave that came out from the Tohoku earthquake uh, and you can see just how far this traveled across the ocean. And if I turn that on and press play, you'll see the waves advancing out across the ocean over time. The time scale is at the bottom there and you can see how fast this is moving and indeed how extensive. So that's showing you where it went and the rate of moving. Uh, and the map underneath there is showing you the, um, locations that I went to. Now, that also includes for us, let me just turn this off for a wee second again, that also includes for us down here, um, this is uh, something that is also affected by the, the wave came all the way down here, let's find out how far away that is. Go from here, mm, it's curving, oh, well, that's a bit weird, it's not straight line distance, well remember the earth is curved, this is a flat map, uh, and we're going from a distance of 13,000 kilometres, uh, this line will curve and um, that is the straight line distance despite the fact that it doesn't look like it 13,000 kilometers away all the way down here to the Antarctic continent and what did it do at this point let's open this up and see open a new tab and let's have a wee look this is an ice shelf that was hit by the tsunami waves and you had these number of icebergs that were broken off from it. Now this largest one was the size of Manhattan Island in New York. It's very, very big. And when you consider 13,000 kilometers away, the other side of the world, this tsunami had this kind of impact. But it would be interesting to compare that, I think, to a few earlier tsunamis. So let's take a look at the Boxing Day tsunami in 2004 in Indonesia. Now this was the one that uh, gave the world the first set of uh, video footage really of any kind of tsunami and it was so so powerful. Tragically uh, over a quarter of a million people lost their lives in this earthquake uh, and the tsunami that followed and you can see how far around the world it went so it gives you a little bit of scale from that. Let's go back in time a little bit further to um, a tsunami that came out from Alaska in 1964. Now, of course, we've been up there taking a look at volcanoes. You know, this is a destructive plate margin. So that's exactly the kind of place where you're going to get tsunamis because the subducting plate drags the non-subducting plate down as it heads down. And eventually the non-subducting plate springs back up again. And that's what release, releases the energy. You can see again how this is spreading around the world. But let's take a look at this one. Uh, 1960 in southern Chile and we'll have a look at the extent of this tsunami. Look at that. Look at how devastating that tsunami was and as it went around about the world. So you can see that these tsunamis are concentrated in these destructive plate margins here because they, that's where you've got the subduction occurring and affecting the Indian Ocean and affecting the Pacific Ocean especially. That's where they tend to be concentrated. Okay, so let's jump in though to our first little task that you're going to be doing here, which is your bookmark one, your general overview. So we're just going to explain a little bit of the location of Japan. So let's have a look at the task and what you're being asked to do. You're to describe the location, its position in the um, Pacific Ocean and where it is in relation to plate boundaries. Now there is the Pacific Ocean. So north, south, west, east, get the position of it and also the plate boundaries. Now you can of course turn on the legend. This is the American way of referring to them. Divergent is moving apart. So you have to think about how we refer to that. Plates moving apart, what type of margin is that? Transform is moving alongside each other. What type of margin is that? Convergent is moving together. 
What type of margin is that? Well, there are a couple that we can choose from, but we know which one this particularly is because here's your second piece of evidence. You've got to get another piece of evidence to support your answer. And if you zoom in a little bit, there it is. So you should be able to identify the type of plate margin that is. It's position where it is in the Pacific Ocean. It's position in relation to plate boundaries and identifying the type. That's your first task. Okay, what about the second task? This time we're going to zoom in a little bit more to Japan and have a look at the earthquakes that occur in Japan. So bookmark here, Japan overview, and there is the earthquakes, there's the legend. Now, in this case, um, the size of the circle is proportional to the size of the magnitude of the earthquake, but also it's color coded. The darker the green, the bigger the earthquake. Okay, so your job here is to describe the distribution. These are um, earthquakes bigger than magnitude 7. Remember, that was the magnitude that I experienced in San Diego. So this is a, an earthquake I felt 250 kilometers away from the epicenter. These are big earthquakes. So what you need to do here is to compare the east-west variations and the north-south variations, also talking about where they don't occur. So east-west, there's your eastern part, your western part. Plus also north, and if you take here, look northeast versus southwest, there's definitely a variation there. And then, of course, you can zoom on in. Uh, oh, no, don't zoom in because I've got that set just to appear at that location. So actually, don't zoom here. But you can click on these and you can get something in uh, about the size uh, and the depth of these earthquakes. So you can quote some of them. There's the dates and the size and the depth. So quote me some evidence, please as you go through describing that pattern. Right, next up, we're going to go in and take a little bit of a look at where the epicenter was and find out a little bit about where the focus is on this earthquake. So bookmark here at Honshu, that's the island there, Honshu overview, and there is our epicenter. Now, you can zoom in and out a little bit here um, if you want. So what we're going to do is to try and get a little bit of a sense then of the depth of this earthquake. Now, how are we going to do it? Well, you're going to have to get some measurements here. The measurement tool here. You're going to measure the distance from here to the coast. Now, I'll not do it for you, but just drag that out till you get to the nearest point in the coast. And then if you click on this, it will also give you the depth. Now, I'm just going to click on this to show you a little bit more about what's happening here at this point. This is a kind of a, a side on view of uh, giving you the cross section, a little bit of the plan. Here is the um, Pacific plate subducting down here um, into the mantle. And as it does so, you can see the location of these earthquakes. There's the Tohoku earthquake there. So you can see that the earthquakes get deeper and deeper as the subduction keeps on going. Uh, although you do get some over here caused by the volcanoes and the magma coming up. But we're focusing mostly on these. There is the Tohoku plate. So what you want to be doing is to try to get not the epicenter here, but the focus of it. And you're going to plot that onto this graph. Now, how are you going to do that? Well, the two things you've measured. You need the distance from Japan, you're going to measure out that way. And you need the depth, you're going to measure out that way. And once you've got those, you're going to plot those on this graph. How are we going to do that? Let's go to Insert and um, Shape and just choose a circle. Now, I'm not going to plot this in the right place. Um, just to illustrate it for you, that's your little circle there. And you can fill it in whatever color you like to make it stand out. There it is. And then a wee text box beside that for you just to put um, the focus of the earthquake there, something like that. So that's not the location. And uh, so I'll just get rid of that now. But that's how you're going to plot it on there. And it's going to show you where the focus of the earthquake is. Okay, next up, we're going to go on to take a look at the impacts in terms of the loss of life in this earthquake. And um, the loss of life was largely due to the tsunami. Um, so what we're going to go here is the Honshu overview and the number, the layer, the number of deaths. 
there it is and there's the layer here the number of deaths now the question this time again is to compare the east-west variations and the north-south variations uh, so that's what you've got to do here. So there is your east-west variation again and your north-south variation. In particular, I'm interested in you relating that to the distance from the epicenter. Now you will also need to quote evidence. Remember, you have to quote figures to support that. You're going to get that from the legend. There's your key there. And if you click on those, it'll tell you the locations. So you can get the names of the locations. And from the key, then, you can get the number of deaths that were found at that location. As I've already mentioned, most of the deaths that occurred from this earthquake were as a result of the tsunami. So it's time for us now to go and take a look a little bit more about how the tsunami hit this part of Japan. So we're going this time to the Tohoku overview which is this one here. It's going to zoom us in just a little bit more. And I'm going to turn off the layer, uh, the deaths. And I'm going to turn on the layer, tsunami wave height. And again, we can get our key. In this case, the color tells you the height of the tsunami. The circles are all the same size, but the color tells you the height. So the darker the colors, the higher the tsunami, the lighter the colors, the lower the tsunami height. So here's the question here. To what extent, now do you remember that from last time? To what extent implies that there's not one simple yes or no answer? It implies that the answer is a little bit more subtle and nuanced. You need to be a little bit more careful with this one. So to what, is ex to what extent is it true that as distance from the epicenter increases, north and south, wave height decreases. Now think for a moment why you would expect that to be true. The further away from the epicenter, the more time there has been for the energy to be dissipated or used up. So you would expect a relationship between distance from the earthquake and how severe the hazards were. Remember that no, um, Earthquake, uh, Ridgecrest earthquake in California that I experienced, it was 250 kilometers away. It was a 7.1, but I didn't experience any significant hazards because it was so far away. So you would expect that. But the clue here is that it's not going to be quite as simple as that. To what extent is that true? So look at the northwest patterns along the east coast. Click on some of the circles. Now, let me give you a few more tips with this. There's the epicenter. So let's take a wee look up to the north of the epicenter. First of all, we can zoom in with this a little bit right now as you go from the north up is it true that the colors are getting lighter we have to ask yourself that question are they getting gradually lighter or suddenly lighter now of course you can go in here and get figures uh, of the wave heights at any point there's a wave height of 17 meters now my classroom is about three meters high so think of the height of that up here, let's see, we're still 17 meters all the way up here. Up here, it starts to get lower down to about 9, 8, and so on. So you can grab some figures from there. So to what extent is that true? But then if we come down here to the southern part, to what extent is it true? When you come down here, you can certainly see again it's getting lower as it comes down here. Wave height of um, just over 1 meter. Um, but then in here as well, you've got wave heights of 11 meters. Uh, there's a wave height of nearly 3 meters, that kind of thing. But then what I want you also to do is to do this comparison, because I, I really want you to try and notice this pattern. If you if the, the distance is increasing there, distance is increasing there, but that doesn't look like that. Sure it doesn't. You can definitely see a difference in wave height to the north of the epicenter compared to wave height to the south of the epicenter. Now, didn't I tell you this wouldn't be as simple as a, a yes or no? So I'll be very interested to see what patterns you're able to pull out from that, but there's lots to explore. Jump on in there and extract the evidence on the one hand, on the other, and then in conclusion. Now, typically you would agree with a statement to a large extent, to a certain extent, or a small extent. Large, certain, or small. You can decide for yourself. 
what your conclusion is, but it's got to be based on the evidence. Okay, next up, we've got to try and explain this because that definitely is an unusual pattern. It's definitely a case that the wave height is higher to the north um, and is lower to the south, even though that distance is much, much smaller. Of course, you can get the distance in. I think if you click on these, it gives you the distance. It does, yeah. There's the wave height and it also gives the distance. So you've got some distances there um, where the wave height is lower and distances here, which is much further away, and there's a 20 meter wave height, wow. That's curious, that's odd. I wonder, do you, are you thinking to yourself, why is that? Well, we're about to try and figure it out. We're gonna try and explain this strange distribution, and to do that, we're gonna look at, uh, here's a word we mightn't have come across before, topography, which basically means the height and the shape of the land. And we're gonna take a look at two locations, Sendai, Kamashi. So whereabouts are they? Um, they're marked on by those little pins. If I just turn this off for a second, there's the wave height. Turn that off so you can see them a little bit better. There is Sendai there and there is Kamashi there. Okay. So Sendai is definitely much closer. Kamashi is further away. But whenever we turn the wave height on, we can see that Sendai has lower wave heights and Kamashi is higher. So why? Well, this is where we jump on in and have a little bit of a look. And we're going to relate this to the topography. Now, on this slide, here it explains it to you. The green shaded land is higher, steeper ground. The white and less shaded land is lower, more gentle ground. So what you want to do, first of all, is to compare the topography here at Sendai. Okay, as the wave comes on shore, it's coming on to what type of ground? And how far away is the higher ground? So there is Sendai. And let's compare and contrast that with Kamashi, just a little bit further to the north. Oh, this is very interesting. Now, I'm going to change the base map a little bit. I'm actually going to um, change the base map to imagery because I think that might show it better. And then I can actually turn that layer of topography off for a bit. So you can toggle those off and on just to give yourself a sense of what the differences would be. And what you want to do is to compare those two. So there's uh, Kamashi, go back to Sendai. What are the differences that you see? Now, that brings us to this question here. How does the different topography help to explain the difference in wave height. Now, this is one where I would love you to have a way ex speculate before um, I give you another bit of a clue. What is it about the topography here that differs from the topography here that means that the wave as it approaches in this bay and as it comes in here, clue, as it comes in here, another clue, and it comes into the valley, as it comes in, <coughs> clue, that makes that higher. Now, if you really would like a bit more help, then there is something here for you. Uh, if you click on those bookmarks, uh, I might need to go in a little bit because there's so much data on there, sometimes hard to get the right ones. So zoom in, click on that little, and if you right click, open a new image, or open a new tab, there's something there. And I'm just giving you a quick glance at that because I don't want to give the game away. And similarly then, if you go back up to Kamashi, same thing, click on that. And again, it just takes sometimes a um, bit of careful clicking to get the right thing. Right click, open image, a new tab. And again, just a very quick glimpse there and it's gone again. And um, so those will give you more clues. If you get really stuck, go and have a look at those two images and see how you get on. Um, and I really look forward to seeing what you write with that. It's a challenging wee question. So um, all the best with that one, but um, I'm, I'm sure you'll do well. Okay, next up is our liquefaction risk. So we're going to go to the bookmark Tohoku overview. Uh, there we are, and I'm just going to change the base map back again, I think, to this one of oceans, which is the one that I had before. 
So go to the uh, Tohoku overview. We're going to turn off the layer tsunami wave height and turn on the layer earthquake soil liquefaction. So there's the wave height. Get rid of that. And we're going to turn on the layer soil liquefaction. Okay, we'll put on the legend again. So there's our little legend of the house that has sunk into the ground. And there is the location, or there, there are the locations where liquefaction occurred as a result of this earthquake. Now think for a moment again about how liquefaction occurs. This is not produced by the tsunami. This is produced by the shaking. Now remember the type of ground that is particularly vulnerable to liquefaction. Do you remember that video that we watched of the guy in the park in Japan? What type of ground was he on? What type of ground did he say was very vulnerable to this? Think again of the process that happens to do with liquefaction. Um, is it going to occur in solid rock? Or is it going to occur in soil? Do you remember a little song we might have sung in class that would illustrate this too? So, just reactivate your memory a little bit about liquefaction. And then here comes the question. Describe the distribution of the places, right? So, here's my clue. What's the relationship between the topography, the shape and the height of the land, and whether or not the area has liquefaction? Okay, so remember, uh, I'll just show you this again. The green shaded land is higher and steeper mountains. Um, and these are your plains where you get a lot of De, um, deposition of sediment <clears throat> clue okay so really what I want you to do first of all is to have we look here at the location of where you get the liquefaction and there I would suggest all of those locations in terms of topography have something in common so this is back to where liquefaction does occur and where it doesn't when you're describing the distribution where does it occur and where doesn't it occur here um, and you can um, get a little bit of information there if you click on that just shows you a picture of the, some of the effects of liquefaction so that is your question there uh, oh no sorry uh, yep that one what is the relationship between generally speaking between topography and liquefaction Okay, then we're going to take a look at liquefaction in Tokyo Bay a little bit more closely. So let's click on that and we'll go in here. And um, what I want you to do in this case is to describe the distribution of the places experiencing it. And this time bring in a little bit of an explanation. So the previous one was just describe what's happening. Why is it happening? Why is it that liquefaction occurs? and where it does in terms of topography. Also take a look at distance from the sea. What is it about this area of Tokyo, and I remember the video we watched, that would mean that this area in particular is so vulnerable to it? And then also here, um, proximity to rivers. Mm, the floodplain of a river. What's a floodplain of a river normally made of and how would it differ from this higher ground up here? Why is it that this area is more likely to experience it? So it's the distribution there, but also a little bit of explanation coming in as well based on your understanding of liquefaction. And then finally, we have to take a look at the Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster. It went into meltdown um, because of the tsunami that came in and devastated uh, the, the um, power plant itself. And that released catastrophic amounts of radiation into the surrounding area. So your question now is, we're going to turn off the layer soil liquefaction and the layer ground radiation dose. So let's go back to content. We turn that off. And the radiation, ground level radiation dose. There we go. We'll turn that on. And we're going to go to the bookmark uh, Fukushima nuclear power plant. 
So the question here, again, describe the distribution compass directions, measure tool to get the distance. And again, oh, there's that topography coming in again. Is there any relationship between where this goes and the topography? Now, if you want to see better the topography down below, of course, you can turn that off and on. There's your measure tool up here to get your distance and you get your compass directions. Pretty straightforward little question. And the very final question then is this is still with the uh, nuclear fallout, but obviously that radiation stay there um, for a long time and will stay there for a long time. So what we want to do is take a look this time at the longer term impacts. I'm going to turn that layer on, which is the no entry zone around Fukushima. And I will turn off the layer here of ground level radiation dose that layer there just to simplify that out a little bit um, what you've got here is that well you can figure that out in terms of the distance that is a circle there as you can see so I want you to come out there and measure the distance that's the part of the evacuation zone but of course the evacuation zone doesn't just have a circular pattern but there is a more of a linear pattern here as well and it relates to this doesn't it there's a relationship there. So describe the shape of the long-term inclusion zone, um, commas directions and distance again, and you can relate it to where the radiation went. Definitely a relationship there. And then it says here, use the pop-up box to find out a bit more about what the conditions are like here. Where do you get the pop-up box? Will you just click anywhere on that, anywhere on it, and this little pop-up box comes up. There it gives you a little bit of a description and it gives you this map as well. So if you open that uh, in a new tab, it'll take you through to this map again. And, and there's lots of really interesting things that you can see there. It actually shows you the equivalent um, in terms of the radiation that you would get in terms of the colors compared to things that might happen just in, in everyday life and, and other bits and pieces that you'd be working on. But the, here's the area that has been um, entry has been prohibited and the text that goes with that will tell you what the conditions are like and how long they are likely to be like that and you can fill that in then in that little question so that is our look at the um some of the impacts from this earthquake and tsunami um, and hopefully have, as a result of doing that it's really going to take you into this location and this place so that whenever you're learning this it doesn't just become a, a list of points like that but whenever you look at some of these whenever you're exploring them you'll actually be able to travel in your minds back to these locations that we went to so i hope you enjoy this little gis task and i very much look forward to seeing what you're able to uncover all the best